this. All right, so um, your review assignment is just last year's midterm. So like I've done in many of my other classes, um, the structure of our exam might change slightly since it is open, open book and open note. So it might be a little bit more in depth in a few places. I might change some of the, um, some of the other, other aspects slightly, but it's still gonna have this general format. Um, rather than rewrite an entire practice test, I thought you guys would get more out of using this as a review sheet than um, me just giving you a study guide with no like, review assignment. So um, don't be alarmed if it looks slightly different in terms of structure when you start the test, but it'll be very similar as far as the um, how the points are arranged as well. Um, so there'll be some um, some nomenclature, have you name things, have you draw the structure from the names. Um, this is to be turned in. This is this week's lab assignment. It's listed as homework, but it's going to the same category as all your labs. Um, and as with most of my homework assignments, it's going to be pro predominantly graded on um, completion. Did you finish everything? Um, and then rather than did you get it all 100% right, I might spot check a few things to see if you got it right. Um, but it's going to be, you'll get you know, eight out of the 10 points is just on completion. Um, and then the other two points are just incentive to make sure you're actually trying and not just scribbling stuff in there um, to get your your uh, points for the assignment. Um, the there'll be a section that I'm calling nomenclature is also going to be kind of vocab and this section might change up a, a little bit, especially this bottom section, which was kind of a word bank and matching, um, because this would be, if it's open book, then this would be a really, really easy section, right? Because, um, so I might change this to more of a describe what these functional groups look like or draw an example of rather than matching, um, just to reflect that this is open book. And there's definitely gonna be a section that is that is like that um, classify the hydrogens. Are, is it um, primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? Um, something, something very similar to this. Um, so actually, since we spent a fair bit of time on it, I might make it look more similar to what you did for last week's lab, where it had you um, identify the you know, what types of hydrogens were present and you had to say, you know, primary benzylic and aromatic. So maybe putting some of these other terms here into use. Um, so I, anyway, I'm just, I'm just spitballing and, and kind of coming, coming up with ideas on the fly here a little bit, but get kind of giving you guys insight as to how I'm going to adapt this um, so you're not surprised. Biggest section to nobody's surprise is going to be reactions. Um, it's going to be a, a page that looks very much like this. I'm going to mix it all up. So it's not going to be exactly like this. And you say, so but it's going to be, you know, reactant, uh, um, organic reactant, reaction conditions. You give me the product, just like we've been practicing. And so there'll be 10 of those that are gonna be worth four points each. So, and again, I might make them, I'm, I'm probably going to, since this is open book, this, is, this section is probably gonna, I'm probably gonna grade it um, pretty strictly um, because you, know, you need to be paying attention to Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. And when you have all your notes and everything to help you, I don't think that's asking too much. Although you guys are, feel free to disagree with me either privately or uh, or verbally, um, and I'm always open and receptive to you guys saying you think you know if things are unfair the way I've designed them, um, you can always let me know, and I'll either tell you, well, tough luck, that's that's the way it's going to be because that's the standard way to do this, or ah, maybe you're right, and we'll find some kind of compromise. So, 
Um, mechanisms is going to be another 30 points. And so, so just to recap points, 20 points of nomenclature and the classification stuff. 40 points of reactions. Another 30 points. So that takes us all the way up to 90 points. Another 30 points is going to be mechanisms. So it's going to be, again, I'm going to be pretty strict on these. I'm going to want, I'm going to, um, I'm going to want you to show all of the curved arrows. You know, are they fish hook arrows for re free radical reaction or not? Work your way through. You may be one of the ways that I make this a little bit trickier since this is what we open book is that maybe I don't show you what the product is. So you, I just give you the reaction. You have to write out the whole mechanism, including figuring out what the right product is. So it's not really that big of a difference from these other reactions up here. You just have to show the steps to get there and be paying attention to, is this one that can rearrange? Is this one sin versus anti? You know, Show those steps, make sure that for, for full credit on these mechanisms. Um, and I probably, since we've, we're really doing three major chapters, right? We had the addition chapter, um, actually two addition chapters, alkenes and alkynes. And then we did um, free radicals. That's all we've covered so far, as far as different types of mechanisms. I'll probably am going to pick one from each of those chapters. And on the free radical one, I'm going to want you to show your initiation, propagation, termination, just like we practiced last week. Um, for the other ones, aren't going to have those three stages necessarily. It's going to be more linear. Um, and less uh, categorizing. And then last but not least, there'll be a synthesis section will be our wild card. Um, I may throw in some NMR or some, some IR in here. Um, it'll be something that's, you remember that my last section, my last 10 points are always separates the A's from the B's on the test. So this is gonna be a tricky one, ask you to do some some thinking on your feet um, on in a, what I know is a stressful time situation. I get that. But remember, you know, you should be able to get, you know, at least 80 points just from the first 90, out of the first 90, knowing what's coming and the type of questions I'm going to ask. So this is really to get you, you know, if you get five points out of 10 on this last section, that's not the end of the world. Right? So don't let this one throw you at the end of the test. I'll give you your periodic table of elements, although at this point in OCHEM, it's kind of unnecessary, but it's your safety blanket, right? Um, let's see, I think this is already pretty well spaced out. I might, I might space it out so it's more than eight pages, but again, don't panic about that. That's just to, get, just to make sure it doesn't look too crowded since I'm not actually printing this off. Um, so. Don't panic when you open it up and it says page one of 12. Um, that's probably just because I spaced it out so you had enough room to, to do all your mechanisms and show your work there without being too cramped. And you don't need to print this off. Doing this, just writing your answers on plain white paper is fine. I would ask that you keep them in the right order. That seems like a really obvious thing to have to ask about, but you'd be surprised from the Gen Chem students how many times I get question 1a and 1b and then question 2 and 3 and then question and then part 1d shows up after part number 3 and and that's just a headache because I already gave you a zero for part 1d because you didn't do it but now I have to go back and figure out how to regrade it please try to keep it in order it's not the end of the world I'll still give you credit if it's in the wrong order but since all you have to do is take your pictures in the right order I think you guys can all manage that I know I'm asking a lot of a second year college class, right? Count from one to 12. I guess for OCHEM, that is kind of hard. All right. Any questions about the structure of the test? Seem reasonable to everybody? Everybody's getting geared oh, up for it. Sorry, Sean, just yeah. to reiterate, 
so this midterm is going to pretty closely follow this layout, except for maybe you won't give us as much information. Yeah, I'll make it um, a little bit trickier in a few places. Um, and I'll, probably the biggest one that's going to be changed is going to be this section down here, um, because this is the one where having if you have if it's open book, this is absurdly easy to do matching like this, right? right. I, I have no doubt that open book, everybody could get 100% on this. And so while I want to give everybody 100%, I'm going to probably take either take away the word bank, or make it more in depth somehow have you define them instead of upset doing matching something like that. But it, the point structure will be very, very similar. Okay. Um, while you guys are thinking of things, what did I do here? Oh, I full screened it. Um, these, this section is not required for, to be turned in or anything, but if you, this is just sort of the, a study, this is what I gave the last year's OCHEM class before the, for the midterm to get ready for it. Um, it kind of breaks it down by sections. Um, this is what I was looking at when I wrote that other test. So it's going to be, you know, there's not that much other information here other than I, I listed out the possible mechanisms that I was going to be list calling from. Again, I'm not limiting myself to being from these exactly with it being open book. Um, because as long as you can recognize the type of reaction, you can go to the right chapter and figure it out. So there might be a few similar mechanisms that aren't listed here that are in the book or that we've talked about um, that I might pull from from those. All right, I think that that's, if you've got the practice test, I don't know that you need this necessarily as much the uh, vocab terms are are on here but i also gave you the end of chapter material too right um so if you want more practice or if you want to look at the reaction summaries if you want a list of the vocab terms from each chapter go to the end of chapter material and each of these has a list of vocab terms and, and skills that you are supposed to pull, take away from that chapter in here. So this would be a really good um, section start. And the way that I would use these, since you guys are already pretty current on most of this stuff, it's the benefit of it being a quarter. Only uh, we're only six weeks in, right? So we haven't hasn't been that much time since we started this semester courses that don't have midterms. You get to the final and half the stuff. It's been so long that you don't even remember that you ever covered it. Um, we at least don't have that problem here. Um, but the way I would study these is to go through these end of chapters, this end, end of chapter material. And all the bolded words should make sense. You should know what they all mean. And I think most of them, you're not even going to have to double check. Some of them are going to be like, you know, what the heck is an oxonium ion? We never used that term in lecture. So you might want to go back and double check that you know what's going on in that section. Um, you know, that that would be the way to to make sure you're ready, at least you know where to find all the vocab terms if you need to on the test in the time situation. And as long as you go through here and all of and this this section all makes sense, then you may not need to go back and reread the entire section. You know, that's totally up to you. That's your call that I'm just describing the way that I would study for this, especially knowing it was going to be open, open note. Um, would just be to familiarize myself with where everything is and probably put, you know, make sure you have access to, if you don't have a, a physical copy of the textbook, make sure you have the reaction summaries, you know, saved as a file someplace where it's going to be easy to get to them um, or print it out if you have a printer so that you have them right in front of you. You know, that's a really big part of open book tests um, is knowing where your resources are and how to use them quickly right you don't want to have to waste time on the test having to figure out where the reaction summary is for chapter nine you should 
you know, that should be really, really easy for you to find and quick so that you don't spend time doing, doing that kind of thing. Um, so got some good resources, got the study guide, got the practice test. Anything else you guys want to ask about? Material or structurally? Then at this point, I'll turn you guys loose. I'll open some breakout rooms. You can hang out and work on, start working through the practice test. Um, as you get to things you want to ask questions about, um, either raise your hand in a breakout room or uh, just unmute and ask me. Um, I might I might have to log off around three to switch to switch to my laptop um, for a for a short moment, but it but I'll be around as long as you guys are in here and uh, working on it. Then um, up until four. All right. And have at it. John, I already have a question, actually. OK. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I know it's not going to be the exact same thing, but I was curious. I don't remember when we went over the mechanism for the peroxies with the acid catalyzed reaction. And I'm we went if, when that was yeah, maybe. We did that back before we got into alkynes. That was the last mechanism we added from chapter eight. Um, so remember, that was the one that did the weird little sort of shuffle where you bumped a proton over from the peroxy acid to the carbonyl on the peroxy acid. And at the same time, you made like a little bridge. Mm, um, okay. And so you made the peroxide was all in one step. It was like five arrows all in one step. Is that okay. ringing the bell? Yeah. Yeah, I remember now. All right, thanks. Yeah, no worries. Ahead. Yeah, let me let me just get everybody in breakout rooms that wants to be in breakout rooms. Um, and if you can't see when I open the breakout rooms, most if you have the most recent version of Zoom, it should show up as you can pick which one you want to be in. Um, but if you don't see that and you want to be in a breakout room, just let me know and I'll I'll put you in one. Um, Casey, what'd you, what'd you have for me? I was wondering if you had, going back to that problems that you had us do at the end of class. Oh yeah, yeah, um, let's do those. Go ahead. I was gonna ask, can you use the NaNH2 to pull the bromine and the hydrogen off? Because it had the mechanism going from like the TBUOK to an alkene and then um, so you would you would need to go. So it's it still goes through a classic elimination reaction. So if you want to if you want to go all the way to an alkyne, you have to have two bromines that can be removed, and each of the bromines is going to leave on its own, but the the strong base is going to be what removes the other hydrogen. The strong base removes a hydrogen from the adjacent carbon to where the bromine is. So the net result is that you make a new pi bond because you have bromine leaving and a hydrogen being pulled off at the same time. But to go all the way to the alkyne, you've got to do that twice. Gotcha. Um, so let's... How did those synthesis problems go? Did you guys get a chance to look at them? Think you have a good, good understanding? Uh, let me get this opened up so I can see it and we'll share screen and I'll, uh, we can work through this one. Hang on, my cat's being a dick.
sorry, when the cat wants attention and um, and I'm busy, she starts knocking stuff over on my wife's desk. And she she knows where the breakable stuff is. So. All right. Um, so first off for A. This one we can tell right off the bat. So for starters, we've got, we're trying to make a carbonyl and we have more carbons than we started with. So the fact that we have more carbons that we started with means we know we're gonna have to do a um, alkyl addition at some point. And one, two, three, four carbons going to one, two, three, four, five, six carbons and a carbonyl, we only have one re reaction at this point that makes a carbonyl, right? And that's the ozonolysis of a alkene. Chop, would chop off one carbon and turn, or would, would uh, cut an alkene bond and turn it into a carbonyl. So at the very least, we can, we can say, okay, well, I know what we're gonna start with is going to look like that same molecule, but with a carbon where the oxygen is, or some version of that. So let me pull up a little view here. All right. So just to start the exact same way, and keep everything pointed the same direction. If we started here, not started, if this was our um, molecule right before we went through ozonolysis, Remember, that's a two step one. So, step one, ozonolysis or ozone to make the ozonide. Step two, DMS. That's going to give us our final product, right? Because our ozonolysis would cut right there and replace it with a carbonyl. So, we'd be left with the aldehyde. So that means that we need to get to this molecule. And remember, we, the, we started with four carbons. We started with four carbons. We're going to need to get to another three carbons added on there. And then have that go through some form of ozonolysis. So what did you guys say? How are we going to get to here? What's this? What's the step before this? Any thoughts? Using acetylide ion. We're going to have to put the pieces together, especially we're going to need, we know we are going to have to do an acetylide. And the other, remember the other nice thing about acetylides is acetylides, if we have excess um, sodium amide, we can put that carbon carbon alkyne all the way at the end of a carbon chain, regardless of where it starts. It's a strong enough base that it'll cause rearrangement to happen so that it can deprotonate. So if we can get to heptine in any form, if we can get to seven carbons with a triple bond and then expose it to excess amide, that'll take us to the 
terminal alkyne, which we could then partially hydrogenate to get here. So we're going to want to, before this, our, we are going to want to, and let's see, I'll start. My annotations aren't going to move. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, so many tools for drawing on things. Um, so to get here, five, six, seven, one of those, we're going to want a terminal alkyne to go to a terminal alkene. So we can partially hydrogenate this. So H2 with the Lindler catalyst. Can take that terminal alkyne to a terminal alkene, which then can go through ozonolysis and get to our final product. So what are we going to do to get to this terminal alkyne, especially considering all of our alkyne additions, all of our alkylation reactions, we wound up doing with the alkyne being buried in the middle. But if we could, if we could go from So if we want this piece on the left-hand side to be our nucleophile and attack, say, propyl, propyl iodide, or, iot, or sorry, uh, bromopropane, one bromopropane, then we would get one, two, three, four carbons on one side, three carbons on the other. We can get from having our alkyne buried in the middle to being um, to being at the end just by taking this alkyne that's in the middle and exposing it to excess NaNH2. Right, that's that's a trick that we didn't talk about. That's a really, really easy way. If if you want your pi bonds to be at the end of a carbon chain, the easiest way is to not mess around with uh, moving the pi bond one one step at a time, like we talked about in class. If we're just trying to move the pi bond one carbon over, we can use those patterns we did in class. But if we want our pi bond to be all the way at the end of a carbon chain, this is the way to do it it always will move it all the way to the end of the molecule. All right, and sort of the nuclear option, there's no way to stop it in between. Um, but you can always get it to the end just by doing that. And then our second step would have to be H2O to use up the remaining um, sodium amide and make sure it's protonated. Now, all of a sudden, this is looking like something, oh, well, we, that we can definitely make this compound from our starting material. So since I can't just drag to the side with my annotations here, I will go. So how, what pieces would we be putting together to get this? We're gonna have a three carbon piece. that could be attacked by the four carbon piece acting as a nucleophile. So if we had propyl bromide or one bromopropane,
we could have that reacting. So there's our propane. We have a bromine attached to it as well, reacting with um, one butyne. especially if we've already deprotonated it, but we can have that written as a as the same step if we want. One, two, three, four. This reaction is going to put them together. Bromine leaves. We attach everything together, right? That gets us our seven carbons. Or if we don't want to show the deprotonation as being a separate step, if we wanted to save a number of steps, we could just write it as step one, excess NaNH2, step two, um, expose it to the propyl, propyl bromide. So Br, Br, but we have that written as a reactant. So, so it would just be a matter of reacting those together in the presence of excess sodium amide. Would give us our seven carbons in a row. And then if we continued to have even more, this looks like we're doing the same reaction twice in a row, but the first time we just deprotonate enough to get this this substitution to happen, then we need to expose it to even more sodium amide. So excess really means excess, and that would take it all the way to the terminal heptime. So then it's just a matter of, if we're trying to start from one butene, we actually had a pattern for that, right? a pattern to go from the alkene to the alkyne. You have to expose it to Br2 first and then have it go through that double elimination reaction. Um, and apparently there's a deadline on Canvas for quiz five that's showing up this Sunday. That's, pay no attention to that. I don't think I've even published quiz five yet. That's gonna be after the midterm. Um, so don't worry if you have two deadlines, I'll fix that as soon as we're done here. So I'm going to clear all my annotations here and clean this up and then just get us to this one butyne from one butene. If we want to go from one butyne to one butene, the first thing we did was we brominate it twice and then have it go through double elimination. So to do this, first thing you do is you take that and you Br2. Second step, double elimination. So NaOH or NaOET is one they've been showing us using sodium ethoxide as a strong base to have it go through a double elimination. Actually, that'll just take us through the first elimination. So we could actually just go straight to NaNH2. Well, then it'll brominate both sides first, and then we'll have both bromines pulled off. And then the last step is H2O, just to protonate, make sure that it's ready to go. Although since we want to then use it as a nucleophile, we probably don't even really need this step three, right? Because we just left it there, then that would take us straight to the deprotonated form.
right? So first synthesis one, Casey, go ahead. Sean, how does the mechanism work to bring that alkene that's in the middle to the end? It's a, it's a rearrangement reaction. It's just one that's going to happen because the deep, if you have a strong enough base, the deprotonated alkyne is so favorable that it's going to be, it's a lot like a carbocation rearrangement. Um, I don't know if I have a good figure showing it right now. Uh, the nation. Um, see, what we get there. I thought I missed an R in there. So this is showing how you can make the uh, something. There's the mechanism for making the alkyne. Let's see if it has the mechanism. It does not have the mechanism on here for it. It's and I it's gonna be it's gonna look a lot like a rearrangement, but I think it's more difficult to draw. Um, and it's gonna be repetitive. And it's going to be hard to say, well, if it just moves over one carbon, that doesn't really make it more stable. It's really, it has to be a consecutive thing. You have to show multiple steps in a lot of cases. Yeah, it doesn't, I don't see, I think the reason why we haven't covered it so far is because when I was looking for the mechanism for that, it wasn't in, you know, it's not in the standard OCHEM stuff you guys are expected to know. So I just left it off. Um, but the mechanism for forming the alkyne in the first place though, is just, is just this, a, an elimination happening twice. Um, just like we, we would normally expect. Um, so, that part is makes a lot of sense. And I'm not going to ask you to show the mechanism on a synthesis problem as well. If that makes sense. I kind of sidestepped your question, but it was that satisfying at least a little bit. Works for me. Okay. All right. Anybody else about this? The first. The first synthesis problem. Second one, we have to do something similar. We have to add one carbon, not two, and we have to move our pi bond over one spot. So it's going to involve turning this whole piece into an acetylide that would look something like that. Nah. With a negative charge at the end and using that to attack methyl iodide or methyl bromide. So anytime we want to add just a single carbon, we're going to have to do something like this. That would allow us to add on one additional carbon and put our pi bonds in the right place. So we'd start by taking our starting material and exposing it to Br2 to dibrominate it. Then second step, excess NaNH2 having this bad of handwriting in red makes it look like a Stephen King novel or something <laughs> And then from here, 
we expose it to methyl bromide or methyl iodide. Realistically, in a lab, we'd probably use methyl iodide because it's a liquid at room temperature. Methyl bromide may or may not be. And it's harder to use a gas in a synthesis than it is to measure out a liquid. Um, but realistically, methyl bromide or methyl iodide would work here. And that would take us to this molecule, which then we can do a partial hydrogenation to get of the, that would uh, go that leave us the trans isomers. So that's gonna be that dissolving metal, dissolving metal reduction, I think they called it, which is sodium metal in liquid ammonia. which would give us our product here. Actually, I'm, did I miss a carbon here? No, that looks right. Right, so these ones specifically I used as the examples here because this you have to do, these are focusing on how do we get the right number of carbons is really the trickiest part of these. Some of them, if you already have the right number of carbons, it's just a matter of how do I get the right functional group where I want it to be. And that's when you're gonna be paying attention to anti-Markovnikov, Markovnikov, Zaitsev versus Hoffman. Right, and so what I'm thinking for number 10, or for the, the I always call it number 10, because my Gen Chem classes, it's always number 10. It's not actually, it's going to be probably part four for you guys. Your wild card section is going to be something involving a synthesis. I might present it kind of like that word problem from last week's quiz, where I don't tell you exactly what the structure of A is, but maybe I'll, I'll give you enough information to figure it out. And then either have you do a synthesis with it or figure out how to synthesize that compound from something else. Um, but it'll be somewhat, it'll be similar to these questions, just make you think outside the box maybe to get there, um, to get your final answer there. Right, and remember when it comes to time, do you at least have a plan that you can write down for that last one? Even if you don't have time to work that out exactly, but you know, you know, I don't know exactly what this is going to be, but I know it has to go through this intermediate. And I know that you would do that by doing a double elimination. And that's all you have time to write. That's at least going to be some partial credit there. Right. So don't just leave it blank. If you have an idea of what to do, give me a game plan there and I can give you some credit. Hey, Sean. Yeah. So with the first one we just went over, you went backwards, right, to the first step. And on this one, you went forwards to backwards. Is there like a a, a way for us, like, should we be always be doing it like one way? Or why did you just skip around like so that? It, uh, almost always going backward is going to work better. In this case, because I could look at it and see I need to add a single carbon. I, when you get better at it, you need to go, you need to work backward less. When you can look at it and see what the game plan is. Um, then it then it becomes a lot easier to just go linear left to right when you have can picture it in your head. Um, so sorry, I should have done I should have been consistent for you guys. Starting at the end and working backward is almost always going to be the easiest route. Um, maybe the only exception to that is if you know you need to do you need to add a single carbon on. If you need, if you know you need to change your carbon skeleton and you can see how you can do that from where you start, you could do that piece of it and then sort of work from front and back at the same time. It doesn't, but I don't care what order you go in. It's usually going to make more sense um, to start at the end and work backward though. Good question. Sorry about that. I thought about that halfway through that problem. 
it's it's like watching Bruce do integrals on the board, right? It's super, super easy as long as he's doing it. Um, but if you if you don't think like Bruce, it's hard to get to to where he started. He confuses me with those things. But then again, you guys have all had calculus more recently than I have. So you should be better equipped to keep up with him. All right. Anything else for right now? Cody? Yeah, I was trying to figure out how I could use acetate as a nucleophile. So anything with a negative charge can be a nucleophile. Need any particular solvent or anything? Acetate's not going to be a better a better nucleophile necessarily. I would have to look at a list of pKa values. Um, acetate might be you might want it to be in a polar non-protic solvent because you don't want acetate to have to compete with the solvent. Water might be a better nucleophile than acetate is, for instance. Um, and again, I would have to look at a, at a chart for that. But remember, anything that you have that has a negative charge is going to be attracted to a partial positive charge, which means anything with a negative charge can be a nucleophile. Um, we've gone over th through some of the strongest nucleophiles but there are other weak nucleophiles out there and, they're, and they would tend to make functional groups we may not have seen yet. Because if you think about acetate acting as a nucleophile, acetate looks like looks like this, right? And so you're gonna have a negative charge on one of these oxygens that could, if we have a good leaving group, Say if we had methyl bromide, acetate could come in here and push the bromide off. And what's that going to look like as a product? It's not going to look like a functional group we studied yet, but it's one that we, we went over what the name of it was back in first quarter, right? This would make an ester. We're going to wind up with the oxygen from acetate attaching to the carbon here. And so our product of this reaction would look like an ester. So again, we, we will start seeing more cases of using things like acetate as a nucleophile as we go. Um, was this one, was this one in the book somewhere? No, this is uh, on the uh, review. Oh, let me see the context. What was I thinking? It's always a dangerous question to ask. <laughs> well, with toluene and acetate and uh, acetylene. Toluene, acetate, and acetylene. It's number 10. Number 10. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, that's, um, sorry, you're, you're talking about the practice test, not the study guide. Um, but that's, that's, in this case, that was the thinking outside the box. Like, well, if you have something that can act as a nucleophile, if anything that has a good leaving group can be attacked. It's kind of the logic I was using, just wanted to double check. Felt like I should add a, a solvent or something. Yeah, well, and you can kind of look at this and say, share screen here, there we go. Get my annotation tools back. Um, you can kind of divvy up this, the final product into the three pieces you have to start with, right? You've got a toluene piece, you got a benzene ring with one carbon attached to it, and then two carbons, and then, and acetate. If you just sort of break it up like that. So 
if you started with toluene and you brominated toluene, because remember, if you don't have a good reactive group, then you need to make one by adding a bromine somewhere, right? So if you made it bromotoluene and then had acetylene act as a nucleophile, then your acetylene would be able to come in here if we deprotonated this. This could come into the bromotoluene. And you wouldn't need to show the mechanism for this necessarily. But um, if we prep the if we prep the toluene by making a bromotoluene, and then we prep the acetylene by making acetylide ion and had it attached there, then all of a sudden we get something. Looks like a benzene ring. Actually, no, hang on. We wind up adding two carbons to our toluene, which then we would want to add a bromine. We, we could partially hydrogenate this to take it to let's see something that looked like that. And then we could do an anti-Markovnikov HBR addition to put a bromine on the terminal carbon here. And I'm going fast because you guys haven't looked at this one this long. And if you think about it long enough, I think you could figure it out. You could fill in the blanks at least. So then we would be looking at one carbon, two, three carbons with a bromine attached on the end. And then if you expose it to the acetate, it can react like, a, like we were just talking. Acetate can come in here push the bromine off, go through an SN2. Right, so all of that to say that sometimes with these synthesis problems, especially um, where you have really distinct groups, um, trying to recognize the pieces in your final product will help you figure out how to put them together. As soon as, like when you just look at 3-phenylpropyl acetate, it, it's not exactly obvious how this is happening, but when you can say, okay, well, that's acetate right there. That's toluene right there. And then there's two carbons in between the two. It kind of starts breaking it up in your head. So you can, when you can recognize the pieces, figuring out the pathway to put them together becomes a lot easier sometimes. Could you use the uh, MBS as a chemical reagent after tooling? I'm sorry? Can you use the MBS as a chemical reagent after tooling? Um, we have not. So we would be using, um, because it's benzylic, we not we don't need to worry about the competing reaction or the competing addition reaction. Um, but yes, NBS would work. N bromosuccinamide would work as the the reactant to brominate that toluene as our first step. That would give us a CL uh, with toluene, right? And N NBS is N bromosuccinamide, so that would put a bromine on there. That will also create a base uh, alkene cotton at the as a product as well, right? That would leave us with it would not leave us with a an alkene if we expose the toluene to NBS and light. We would get that's how we would get the bromo toluene. We get that product um, because remember the n bromosuccinamide is a way to add bromine to a benzylic or an allylic position without having a high enough concentration of bromine for it to go through the addition reaction.
because it's benzylic in theory, you could just say um, plus bromine and light. Because there's really only one place for that to react. If it was an allylic, where we had, if we wanted to add a bromine here, if it was um, an alkene, we would want we would need to use NBS because if we expose it to just bromine, we would have that addition as a competing reaction, where we'd be, we would be breaking the al the alkene and adding a bromine to each side. Um, that's not really an issue with toluene because it only it we're never gonna break up that benzene ring like we talked about. Um, and there's only one place for that bromine to be added. Um, so it's less necessary to say NBS in this case, but it's the safest, the safer decision. If you wanna add your ben a bromine specifically in the benzylic or the allylic position, NBS is your, your go-to reagent for that. Okay. And that would might... mean that Go ahead. you would have to ask them to attack as well, right? To get the major product at the end with MBS, you'd have an F2. Um, this one would be go through the free radical reaction. At the end, the acetate acting as the nucleophile would go SN2. That, that means that the carbonyl group will be re reduced. Let's start before this one not so we're never going through a carbonyl group we're leaving acetate the way it is um and maybe I, i'm just having a hard time hearing hearing you with your microphone are you seeing m as in mannequin or n as in nitrogen yeah uh, what do you mean are you talking so there there is another chemical compound called mbs M as in man, or are, are you talking about N as in nitrogen? The N, yes, the nitrogen. Okay, yeah, so so we would only use the NBS at the beginning. We wouldn't use it to try and reduce anything further along. And that way we don't wind up reducing the, the carbonyl at any point. Um, and because it really NBS is only, we only use NBS in the case of brominating, um, the allylic or the benzylic position. We're not going to use it in any other context. Um, if we tried to use it to add the bromine at the end, it's going to wind up adding in the wrong spot. We need to make sure we add the bromine in the, um, we do the bromine addition in the, to get the Hoffman product to put our bromine specifically at the very end of the molecule. If you tried to use NBS to add that bromine, it would add it in the benzylic position again. And we would wind up adding our, we would wind up making a very different compound. It look, would look somewhat similar. Um, we would wind up making, so one carbon, there's our toluene there, we added two. If we tried to use, to go from here and add the bromine using NBS, we would add the bromine to this position, not at the end. We want the bromine to go at the end of the molecule in order for acetate to add at the end of the molecule. So we have to add, we have to do, um, it would be HBr and OOR. HBr in a peroxide would give us the uh, product that we're looking for, because then that would give us. This would also have to go through hydroboration too, right? Hydro... So we wouldn't we wouldn't want to use hydroboration because we need it to be a good leaving group. If we did hydroboration, it would put the oxygen in the right spot, but then we wouldn't have a good leaving group. Bromine's a better leaving group, so we want to do the anti-Markovnikov um, hydrobromination, which would give us this molecule. Again, when I move this, it's going to, my annotations aren't going to make sense. There. 
I can't move these. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and then we can have acetate come in here and do the SN2 and add the acetate group to make the, est the ester at the end. Um, basically, NBS, you should only be trying to use NBS if it's going to be a free radical bromination, which if, if we're trying to do an addition is not usually what we want. Um, we want it to be an addition and we want to be anti-Markovnikov. So we're still going to go through somewhat of a free radical mechanism, but not using NBS because NBS would only add in this position in between the two here. Yeah, that's why I uh, meant the carbonyl group reduction would happen later because of this, but yeah, I see what you mean. All right, any other any other specific problems that you want to go over so far? Yeah, one more for you. Okay. With a bicyclic ring that has a pi bond on one of the rings, the ozone olysis, you're I'm still going to have one ring structure if you only have one pi bond and yeah yeah this is a good one because you have to you have to see it in 3d right yeah you have to be able to count your atoms in three dimensions so if we go through ozonolysis we'll break it right here and turn both of those into carbonyls but you're still going to be left with a five-sided ring structure so you'll be left with something that's a lot easier to draw you know, if you're not using a mouse to draw it anyway, um, where it's connecting. So you did have these two were connected before, right? And so those are still where the other carbons are attached. They're just no longer attached together with an alkene bond. They each have A carbonyl instead. If you count with these, these kind of kind of are really hard to see and know if you got it right. So the trick is to make sure that you can count oops, that you have the same number of carbons before and after. Because if you do ozonolysis, we don't change the number of carbons, we just change how they're connected, right? We break them up into pieces sometimes. Sometimes they're not still attached but this still should be the same raw number of carbons. And so this was five, six, seven carbons before. I made that mistake initially, just put two carbonyls right on the ring. Like, wait a second, that's not right. Yeah, so if you think about it, if you think about flattening this molecule out and looking at it from above with the, or from the, you know, the top left, um, so that you're looking at it as though the cyclopentyl group was flat, so I'm going to just, I'm going to erase all this and just redraw the starting molecule for the sake of. John, is, that, is, um, is that cyclohexene or cyclopentene? Because that looks like seven right there, but then you're drawing it as five. So it's these ones. Mm -hmm. There's six, that's cyclohexene, mm -hmm. but you've got one extra carbon that bridges between carbon one, we'll call this carbon, carbon two and carbon six. Yeah. Um, and so what that does is you have a cyclo, if I can erase oh. this circle, Okay. these, these ones, these yeah, bicyclic, yeah. like I said, you got to see it in 3D. Those ones circled in blue, that's a five-sided ring. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. if I try and, I might as well draw this as color-coded. So if I take the ones that I circled in blue and draw them out as blue here, the other two carbons that I'm going to circle in red, those could be in between. We can So they're underneath that that uh, five-sided ring. So this would be if we were, if our eye, remember how we used to draw our eye like this when we were doing Newman projections? If we look at it from over here, 
even harder to draw an eye this way than it is on the board. That kind of, you can kind of see what I'm talking about there, right? So if we're looking at it from that angle, if we put our eye in the plane of the paper and look at it from that angle, this is what we would see. A five-sided ring where two of the carbons are connected with another two carbons. And those are the ones that we're breaking. So we are left with still a five-sided ring, we're just going to put a carbonyls onto each of those last two carbons. So we're breaking that and we'd be adding. Which when we clean it up. It's going to look like. Yeah. And if you wanted to draw the aldehyde on there, you could, but you wouldn't need to necessarily. Or draw the, the aldehyde hydrogen, rather. I mean, that's these bicyclic ones are tricky to draw and visualize, but they still go through the reactions the same way as everything else. You just have to remember, you know, if you're breaking the ring, one of the rings, the other one's still going to be there. If this same molecule, I think this is norbornene, is the name of this molecule. Um, if norbornene went through this, went through a regular addition reaction, this alkene would react just like any other alkene. Um, it just looks funny while it's doing it. Yeah. And if you wanted to see it in 3D, so this is, see if I can arrange it the way it is drawn on the problem, kind of looks like, this, right? And so we're breaking over here, which if here's the view that I was trying to draw before with the perp, with the blue ring. There's our five-sided ring with our two carbons behind it. And so that's what we were breaking are those two bonds right there, that double bond right there. And let's see what it looks like when I have mole view clean it up. Looks like what we have drawn. And if we put that in 3D, get something kind of like this. Though realistically, they're going to be cis relative to each other because they both started on the same side of the ring. So when you broke them apart, they're going to wind up being cis. See if I can get that to clean up. No, nah, it's going to give me the same thing. All right, so this wouldn't really make sense as much because you couldn't really connect these two carbons to each other. The trans version wouldn't really make sense, right? Because there'd be no way you could connect these two carbons without straining it a lot, breaking things up. All right, what else you got? Anything at this point? Some time to think about it? Got All one right, more keep... here. Okay, hit me, Cody. Uh, for the draw the major product section, where we're doing chlorination, since you get a whole mess of products, go ahead and include the different possibilities. So I don't think I, oh, I do have chlorination. So, Chlorination, free radical chlorination, since we know that makes, you know, kind of a little bit of everything, you would want to draw all the possibilities. And I would, I will try to remember to make sure I add that into the instructions. Um, if you're going to get, you know, let's say 
double digit, double digit, digit percent yield of all the different products, just draw all of them. Even though you could typically point to one and say, this is the major, major product um, for the sake here, when in doubt, if you can't pick a major product, include all of them, um, especially with the chlorination, because that's the one that's so going to be so random. Anybody else? Section two, number five. So this is a two-step one, right? But it's neither of the steps is that hard, but it gets hard keeping track of the total number of carbons, right? So the way I would check my answer on this one is okay if if i know that this is going to be you know vaguely what this is going to be is going to be take all of the carbons and stick them together right do a substitution at the end so our product should have all of these carbons and it should also have all of these carbons so if you do this one right you should get something that's got a cyclohexyl ring plus two carbons, and then another one, two, three, four, five carbons, right? Um, if we go through the process, we'll get something that looks like actually. So those are our red carbons. And then the ones in blue, we attach another one, two, three, four carbons in, plus a methyl group. So one, two, three, four with a methyl group. And unless I miscounted, I think that that, and, but the way to check your answer on this one would be to the cyclohexyl is really easy to count six, right? Since we're not breaking that up, um, make sure that the rest of your carbons add up to an additional seven carbons. One, two, plus three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven for the methyl. Um, you don't have to do it color-coded, but if you have the tools to do it color-coded, it might be helpful on the test. Um, at the very least, just be paying attention to that. Bromine does have a prior high, or higher priority, a prior priority um, than, than the double bond because the, that atomic number is the first thing we're looking for. We only use the double bond to differentiate if we have all carbons and an equal number of carbons at that rate. Um, so when we're deciding E versus Z, yeah, you're going to be looking for bromine has, is going to be almost always going to be the highest priority, right? Because it's the highest atomic number of anything we use on a regular basis. I assume you're looking at the... Oh, this one here, when you're assigning priority. Yeah, bromine would be one, then the carbon towards the double bond, then the one that's longer, further away from the double bond, and then the hydrogen. Would that be uh, R? So when you name one, two, three, counterclockwise, right? The hydrogen's already into the board away from us. So counterclockwise would be S.
That's a bit of a throwback, right? Just remember, R is R is right, and S is for sinister, like those lefties. All right, while you guys are working, I'm going to go change that deadline on quiz five to make sure it's not showing you up with a showing up with a fake deadline for you guys. Um, but I'll still be here and uh, let me know if you have any other questions. All right, that should all be fixed. And also just a reminder for everybody, this is a four day weekend for us, for LTCC anyway, um, President's Day weekend. We have Friday off and then the following Monday off. Um, so you know, if you get your test taken on Thursday, so either you have all weekend to study for it, or if you get your test taken on Thursday, you don't have to think about OCHEM for a whole four days in a row, which how often does that happen? Got another one for you, Sean. Hang on one sec. Oh, that's right. You're in the middle of something. All right. Thanks for your patience, Cody. What's up? Yeah, I was just double checking on the mechanism for um, free radicals. Uh, do you mind if there's only one termination step or do you prefer if we show multiple? No, one termination step is fine. Traditionally, the termination step, you don't just want to show the reverse of the initiation. Um, you typically, the convention is that you show the termination step that gives you your overall product. So like for the, um, for the quiz, which was, it was ethyl bromide we were making, right? So we were, yeah. our overall net reaction was CH3, CH2, or CH3, CH3 plus BR2 goes to HBR and the ethyl bromide. So we want to show the termination step that makes that. So the, the best termination step that you could show would be bromine radical plus the ethyl radical reacting together. Because when they react together, that gives us our major product. Yeah, I think I confused myself thinking that that termination was a step that we had already seen in propagation, but in the propagation step, you make another free radical. So yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. So this is the best possible one. If you, sh you show me any termination, you'll get partial credit, but this is the way for a full credit.
And then a lot of sources online, when they show mechanisms for free radical reactions, don't show the arrows. But that's not what I, I want the arrows. So don't just show me the net reaction for each step of the mechanism. I want you to show me you know how to use the right arrows and show where the, where the electrons are moving. All right, and as I meant, go ahead, Cody. <laughs> Sorry, I was just uh, uh, in my mind thinking about that uh, termination step with what I'm working with. The in order for me to use that termination step, I'd have to have the secondary free radical as opposed to a tertiary free radical, but that's acceptable. Um. So. This is the one they remember the reason that this one goes anti Markovnikov is because it pulls the pulls the bromine and makes the bromine bond first. So your termination step, you would you would still have a tertiary radical, but it would look like It would look like this. Terminate with a hydrogen, maybe? And so then it would be terminating with a hydrogen radical. That makes more sense. Sorry to be nitpicky about it. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, this is where you should be nitpicky and paying attention to that. Um, and I would even double check that there's not a specific termination step for this class for the anti Markov Nikov HBR, because we don't see hydrogen radicals very often. Yeah, that was the last connection actually. Book was uh, the, the two bromines coming together, which is not the same as our initiation step, but. Right. Let me, so let me, let me check the textbook and make sure. That's yeah, actually what I was asking about earlier, Sean. I think I misspoke and said peroxy, and I meant peroxide. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, I, I just heard the peroxy acid one. No, yeah, um, and I agreed. I was like, okay, that sort of makes sense. And then I thought about, I was like, no, he was talking about peroxy acid. But um, yeah, let me. Yeah, let me I just pull that up. okay. I I still can't find it in the Klein book, was specifically with HBr. But I looked it up, and they had uh, another HBr molecule coming in, and that bond breaks and it attaches, but. I think yeah. I was able yeah. to find it in chapter 10 somewhere. I yeah, it, it is on page, uh, page 465. Um, and you're, you're right, Cody, for that one that it just does show the two bromines coming together to make BR2. That's just showing a termination step and that's, that's actually contradicting themselves because this book says traditionally you show the one that makes the product. Um, but I'm guessing it's because you don't have, you're never going to have a lot of hydrogen at, um, hydrogen radicals floating around. Yeah. They're going to make hydroxides with the R group. Right. So I, in, in that case, pick one, if you're, if you're matching it up to what's in the book, then yeah, you would just do, do that termination or any, any radical two radicals you have floating around are fair game you could show you know a bromine radical running into a, pero a peroxide radical if you wanted that would be a legit termination step um even if it's not making I, ideally if there's a good way to do that but we don't have a good way to show um the and i guess that's that's your your test for this is if you have the two radicals floating around in your propagation steps that could react together to make the net product, then do that. We don't have a hydrogen radical floating around here that could react to like the way I have it drawn on the board. If we don't have any hydrogen radicals floating around, then we can't have this happen. So then in that case, just pick two, 
two radicals that you do have floating around and have them react together as your termination step. It's nothing that it, it's less important that you do pick the right termination step than it is that your propagations add up to the net reaction. If that makes sense. Yeah, where you cross one line on each termination step and yeah. I had forgotten that ideally you make your termination step your product too, so that's a good reminder. Yeah, I didn't focus on it too much. I use it more as an example that you can get a whole mess of different stuff in there. So it's, it's like I said, it's less important than the propagation steps. Cool. Appreciate it. Adam, were you able to find that one? Uh, yeah, I did. Thank you. No problem. All right. I'm just going to remind you guys, um, we've been going at this for an hour and a half now. It'd be a convenient time um, to take a break. And I need to switch to my laptop anyway, so my wife can have the office. Um, so I will jump back on here at three. Um, so take a little bit, take a walk, come back if you have more questions, write them down if you have questions between now and then. Um, and then we can keep going over questions at three. All right, I'm, I'm going to shut this one down, but come back to this um, same Zoom link um, when you when you get to the when you come back at three. <laughs>